welcome everyone to the next QTech 360 seminar. Um, so at QTech, we're studying full stack approaches to a quantum computer. And in my mind, a key question then is how strong can you make your foundation? And the speaker of today has actually been studying this question, I believe his entire career. And it's therefore with great pleasure to introduce uh, Giordano Scappucci. Uh, Giordano is an expert in semiconductor materials, nanofabrication. Uh, already during his PhD at the University of Rome in Italy, he was making state-of-the-art contributions um, and making high-mobility silicon germanium heterostructures. He continued to do that and make important contributions uh, during his time at the Center for Quantum Computing Technology in uh, Sydney, Australia. And now as a group leader at QTEC, uh, Giordano is still exploring the boundaries of silicon and germanium heterostructures and really making seminal uh, contributions to the field that, that really also define the, the progress of the field. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Giordano Scapucci. Um, during the seminar, if you have burning questions, please ask them throughout. And at the end, we also have time uh, for further discussion. And with that, Giordano, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you, Menno. Um, let, me, let me share my screen. Uh, tried this before. Okay. Can you uh, see the slides well? Perfect. And you can hear me, I trust. So thank you for inviting me to give this uh, QTech uh, 360 seminar. So I wanna start with this image of this uh, uh, bird. So nature does uh, really practical things with uh, quantum mechanics. For example, you have billions of birds of like these ones that um, fly really thousands of kilometers from their breeding grounds to their wintering grounds. And they're really helped in this endeavor with the magnetic compass of extremely high precision. And the recent studies in the past 10 years or so on have actually discovered that there is spin coherence at the basis of these uh, tiny uh, quantum sensors, which give um, a very accurate precision in detecting the magnetic uh, field of, of the Earth with, with a precision of less to a, of a few degrees. And you can imagine that on these really long trajectories, you really need a high precision to get where you want, otherwise it would be a disaster. So this is to say that nature does really practical things with quantum mechanics. and. Uh, the idea with a quantum computer that draws many, many colleagues in the field like myself is to really try to do something practical with a machine that can use quantum mechanics, such as a, as a quantum computer. Uh, however, despite all, all the hype that you hear in, you know, in, in the media and so on and so forth, um, to do something really useful with uh, uh, computing with quantum mechanics, will require millions of excellent qubits. And uh, these numbers are of course vague, nobody really knows, uh, but for sure there is an emphasis on quantity and quality. And uh, um, as you are putting together these large quantum systems, they are really difficult not only to make and to operate, but, but even just to think about them, so to design them. Um, you have to fight a lot of things like decoherence uh, or uh, again, just scaling up the numbers. So, and to get to these numbers, th this might seem a bit depressing nowadays that we have only, you know, at the end of the day, a few tens of qubits in the best platforms. Uh, so how, how will we get there? This, this is really the, a, big, a big question. And uh, I think there is a lot of hope, however, because if you looked at human uh, advances and endeavors, the reality is that we have actually already built really phenomenally complex systems. So you see here three images, um, uh, which you might recognize immediately taken from the history of microelectronics. The first transistors, uh, like the, the really first one in germanium and then the first commercial one in silicon, the first integrated circuit, and then the first microprocessor. And it, it took really decades to get from the first proof of principle of transistor to something that was really useful like a microprocessor. And um, one, what, a few things to highlight here is uh, not only that the, the, the count has gone up, like this is one element here, you integrate a few of them, and here you have actually a thousand of transistors. But if you look carefully at this picture, you see, for example, that here you have three 
wires coming out of one single component. Here you have already one, two, three, four, six uh, uh, connectors for a few uh, transistors. Here you see this is a 16 pin connector for a thousand uh, component inside. And this is the power of integration. And nowadays I kind of even mentioned, but the numbers are, a few numbers are written down here. You can integrate billions of transistors on a single chip which with I think around a thousand uh, outputs. And um, there will be many more transistors on Earth than biological cells in all humans by 2025. But most importantly, there is a gigantic industry behind to sustain this progress. And I think uh, for quantum computing, we should really look at technologies that uh, have these large numbers on their track record. One thing that is often overlooked, however, is that in this endeavor towards you know, higher complex uh, systems and microelectronics, really the breakthroughs can often be traced down to uh, advances in materials. For example, in these three columns and these three, let's say, advances, transistors happened in the first place because we, because we had really uh, good uh, um, germanium crystals of sufficient purity uh, from other efforts in the 40s. Uh, for example, in, in radio detection. Um, the integrated circuit happened because the planar metal oxide semiconductor process was invented based on silicon dioxide, so a planar film on top of silicon. And uh, the last one, which is probably even the most interesting because the jump to the microprocessor is really what enabled real practical application, is actually silicon gate technology in the sense that beforehand, the gates that control conduction in the transistor were made out of metals, and then uh, the inventor of the transistor, which was actually F Federico, which Fajin, and I, I really recommend this biography of him. He explains really the key breakthroughs that enabled this processor was swapping aluminum for silicon that enabled uh, masculine integration of, of, of devices. So in a way, I would like to, to, to convince you in this talk that maybe if we follow, if we are after these kind of breakthroughs, we will make leaps also in, in, in quantum computing. So our, our choice of a qubit system is uh, that we work with mainly is a spin qubit in a semiconductor quantum dot. And uh, this could be in principle, the easiest two quantum level system that you, you can think about. And um, so here you see the, how does this work very, very schematically. Uh, you, you can, uh, similar to a transistor, you use electrodes to, to, to move charge around. And here though, you have many electrodes to shape the potential landscape in a two dimensional electron or whole gas to trap single uh, charge. And by applying a, microwave pulses in a magnetic field that splits the, the levels of the spin, you can control the spin qubit and eventually if you're able to scale this up, you can do quantum operation. Um, so if this is the basic uh, um, structure we work with, uh, the important thing is that really these structures, these semiconductor quantum dots really resemble transistors. Uh, they resemble transistors from uh, a fabrication perspective uh, for sure, not from an operation perspective, which are more, much more complex. But here you see um, uh, an image, a cross-section image of uh, an array of uh, quantum dots obtained uh, in, um, in a FinFET structure. And, um, and the, the nice thing is that this was made in an industrial fab and we see clear proof of principle of qubit operation here. So this is a Rabi oscillation, which is the signature of uh, qubit control. This is to say that this proof of principle uh, experiment that we posted on the archive uh, last year really is, is very significant. It's very iconic because it tells us that really semiconductor quantum dots can be fabricated in an industrial fab. So there is, a, there is really hope to leverage large-scale integration for scaling up. Of course, we might question the material of choice. And, and in this talk, I will present um, mainly germanium work as a, as a new platform. So, as we are putting together all these qubits in an architecture, this is one of the, of, for example, of the, of the visions together. Uh, really, I believe that material advances will empower quantum computing. And uh, these are the two platforms we are uh, mainly uh, working in my group. So these are all based on a silicon wafer and they rely on silicon germanium as a template 
to really tailor the band structure properties of silicon or germanium quantum wells to trap respectively electron or hole uh, charge to make electron or spin qubits. And uh, of course, uh, here is the right moment to give credit to the people who actually do the work in my group. Uh, so you see how all, all the, the, the people in my group, uh, uh, this slide is accurate as of today. And I wanna give credit also to all the people that uh, joined the group before, especially at the start of my group here in QTEC. And a big credit to Amir, uh, who is our resident engineer uh, from TNO, which uh, uh, we work with for the development of these materials. So now today I will focus on germanium as a um, basically a new platform for uh, spin qubits, but as you will see also not only spin qubits. And here it's a little bit also, I wanna stress the aspect that this work has really taken off as a collaboration between my group that focuses on materials and the group of men of elders uh, and his group focuses instead of qubit and operation. And I believe really that this really close feedback loop is a key to advance uh, very fast in the field. And um, I will try to also highlight really which feedback loops really enabled the progress in this endeavor in the germanium quantum technology. Uh, so now let's let's dive a bit deeper into the, um, the platform. So the key point to understand is that we are not really interested in bulk germanium, but germanium under really particular conditions, which is uh, strange germanium quantum wells. So let me, uh, let me show my pointer here. So as you know, uh, silicon and germanium have a different lattice parameter. Germanium is slightly uh, larger lattice parameter, 4%, and silicon and germanium is just a, a linear relationship in between. Now this is a, an advantage and a challenge on its own because, so it's a challenge and an opportunity because from a material perspective, it's a really a challenge to make heterostructures with very low disorder because managing strain as the structures is, is very tricky because they tend to introduce these locations. On the other hand, <clears throat> this is a great opportunity to tailor the band structure. So here you see a bit the playground that you can have with uh, putting a layer of silicon germanium uh, strained on top of a relaxed uh, uh, substrate, which we call virtual substrate. Depending on the compositions, traditionally we've worked with strained silicon quantum wells where a tensile strained silicon, so 0% germanium, is on a CG30. And this has been used for, uh, you know, electron spin qubits. So what we've uh, done instead is to move on the other side of the quadrant and work with germanium rich uh, virtual substrate to then grow a, a pure germanium quantum well which in this case it will be compressively strained. Now, interestingly, uh, quantum well for holes exist only in this configuration, in this diagram, if you think of uh, you know, silicon and germanium. It can exist for silicon germanium also, but uh, if you talk about silicon or germanium, this is the only configuration to have a high mobility uh, two dimensional hole gas. Now, why are we so interested in holes uh, for uh, spin qubits? There are really, I would say, three main uh, uh, reasons. So from a band structure perspective, you really have a band structure advantage here. Uh, so uh, by working with strained uh, uh, heterostructures in germanium, what happens in the valence band is that you split the, the levels. So you're working with what in bulk we, 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 we used to call heavy holes. But then due to strain and confinement, turns out that the, the effective mass is actually uh, much lighter in this topmost band. So um, that's very good if you think of quantum dots because it means that the energy level, the spacing between energy levels is larger. And so you can actually make quantum dots that are actually bigger. Um, the other thing is that uh, holes have inherently a spin orbit coupling that can be tuned by strain and design. And so it means that you have a, a direct handle um, to control uh, qubits via uh, gates. So you re reduce the, uh, the complexity of a, and the footprint of a, of a, of a qubit uh, tile. The second, uh, let's say, reasoning is that these quantum wells offer a really quantum grade environment in terms of electrical disorder, because these are buried channels. Um, you are far away from the nasty oxide interface. By working with uh, holes and not electrons, the wave function has very little overlap with the, the nuclei uh, spins, which are a main cause of decoherence. 
And eventually you can even uh, uh, get rid of the uh, nasty nuclear spins, which in germanium are the spin nine halves from uh, uh, germanium 73. Finally, last but not least, and really important, uh, from an integration perspective, germanium is fully qualified to enter a CMOS foundry. Uh, here you see an image of germanium finfets on uh, very similar structures like ours. So, and the, the, there is a really a nice balance between having a, <clears throat> a small footprint that you know enables large scale integration, but at the same time, due to the effective mass, uh, these devices are large enough that you can progress uh, very quickly in an academic setting like ours. The last element, which is very important, I will spend quite some time on this, is the fact that you can do a direct uh, contact between metals and, and the whole gas, because um, basically every kind of metal tends to have a Fermi level pin to the valence band uh, with germanium. Uh, this is also the reason why it's very difficult to contact electrons in germanium and not holes. And this doesn't really happen in silicon. So here you can really get a good uh, neuronic contact uh, by using every kind of metal, especially superconductors, which can, can open a completely new research path as we will see. So now moving on to uh, um, a few results here. Another question that is a legitimate one is, okay, well, but why has this really taken off now and not, and not before? This is a really nice indicator of progress. If you take mobility, and we published this in our, in our uh, recent uh, review article in Nature Review Materials last year, if you take mobility as an as a indicator of at least you know, qualitative uh, progress on the heterostructure quality, you see that you know, the first whole gases were actually done 30 years ago, but the quality was extremely poor because people used to grow a constant composition a buffer layer on top of silicon. So directly a silicon germanium uh, high percentage, and that really had a lot of defects in this location. Then uh, we moved to forward grading, meaning that you slowly introduce silicon up to the, um, uh, to the uh, sorry, so introduce germanium up to 80%, but that yielded really thick layers. And again, with thick layers came a lot of dislocations and defects. So the key enabler was to uh, really swap and do reverse grading. And here you see an image of what the, this means. It means you, you actually put uh, a layer of germanium directly on silicon and under certain condition, the top part of the layer is very nice and clean and people actually do photo detectors with germanium and silicon. And then you grade in a small amount of uh, silicon. So the, the, the gradient you have to fulfill is only 20%, meaning this set construction can be much thinner and with less defects. And the top most part here of the, heteros of the virtual substance is really nice and clean. Then you grow your quantum well. And the next enabler was to actually get rid of uh, modulation doping to put the uh, charge into the quantum well. And here really was our contribution to try to do reverse grading and get rid of modulation doping and see where we would get. And um, in this heterostructure, really the three, there are three key parameters I wanna highlight. This is the percentage of germanium in the virtual substrate which sets the lattice parameters and in turn it sets the strain and therefore a lot of the band structure parameters. The thickness of the quantum well and very important, the separation of the quantum well from the dielectric interface. Here are a few experimental results from our, our first uh, uh, quantum wells where you see, of course, a TM section of the, of the virtual substrate. Here a nice and uniform uh, uh, quantum well, nice and flat. And here with X-rays, we actually measure the strain in the quantum well and see that it's exactly how we designed the quantum well to be. So that means we have a full control of the other structure growth. Now let's see if we actually, from an electrical perspective, fulfill all the promise and the nice properties I put forward uh, a few minutes ago. So we see we have strain, but what about uh, the quality of the, the whole gas? Um, these were really our first uh, results where things were not really optimal, but still they were very good. In fact, we got a mobility of half a million. Again, if you take this as, a, as an indicator of, uh, of quality, However, you can already see in this uh, plot that there were things to improve because the, the lowest density we could achieve was uh, still quite high in the order of 10 to the 11. And this is another critical parameters for uh, the qualified qubit environment, so the, the percolation density. But nevertheless, we got really, we were really excited. We got really textbook quantum wall effect, fully tunable by, by gate. 
And uh, most important, you, you s simply look at these traces and recognize this is a single band material. So you really have this uh, splitting of the energy levels that you, that you were after. The other really promise that we fulfilled was the one of the effective mass. So these high quality wafers enable really a detailed magnetic transfer characterization with the fan diagram, so tracking the Landau level energies as a function of density. And from here, by thermal activation, we can extract the mass as a function of density. And you see here that you have a, a, a dependence of the mass with the density due to the fact that the bands are actually non-parabolic at a finite Fermi wave vector. But if you extrapolate this at, at zero density, you get a mass of 0.05 which is actually the, it really matches the theoretical predictions with theory. So again, this is just to say, we can really make our retrostructure by designing the strain to get really parameters of the material that we actually want. So we've shown high mobilities, meaning low disorder. We've shown light effective mass. And other parameters that we can still get from uh, um, transport measurements before going to quantum dots is actually the spin orbit coupling, this is a Rashba kind of spin orbit, and it's mainly due to intermixing that you get um, between heavy holes and light holes at a finite density. And we developed a very subtle but very nice method, that elegant, I would say, uh, to actually measure the HH-LH splitting and then in turn have an idea of the spin orbit coupling energy here. So if you look at the Landau levels, at some point uh, uh, the spin split bands cross and there is a zero, um, a vanishing Zeeman energy. And this really happens at a certain point in, in, in a magnetic field and filling factor at a critical field from which uh, you can really extract the energy splitting. We've done so in this, in this plot. You see here how experiments and theory match nicely. And you can extract a splitting of around 75 milli electron volts, which again means really large splitting between the bands. And from this, we can estimate uh, the, all the parameters related to uh, spin orbit energy here, at least in a 2D system. Now, of course, uh, once we got this really high quality material, the next thing was to actually hand this over to Menno's group and really in, in very short, uh, time, uh, you've seen this data uh, many times. This was the first demonstrations of very uh, stable, clean and quiet quantum dots, which then enabled the uh, um, two qubit experiments. But really uh, the novelty here, I would say, is that with respect to other qubit, the two qubit technologies, like here we really use uh, only tra transistor only technology. So there's no other, uh, we use spin orbit coupling to drive these qubits very fast. And these are really nothing more than transistors and high mobility germanium, but operated as qubits. Here is also nice control. You can go from moving the barriers from a two quantum dot system. If you move the coupling, you can go to a single quantum dot. Again, this put, let's say the platform uh, under the radar of the community, I would say, but then we were not really satisfied. I, I would say from a materials perspective, because I said, we knew the percolation density wasn't the best we could get. And so here comes in a nice feedback loop on the materials that which I wanna highlight. So uh, the previous quantum wells were positioned at around 20 nanometers from the surface. And eventually we moved the interface deeper. And here you cannot move it as deep as you want because then you will lose electrical, uh, electrostatic control for your quantum dots. So there is a, a trade-off you need, need to meet. And we think uh, we, we are at a good stage here with these quantum wells, which are around 55 nanometers deep. And here we really saw a big advancement in the material, especially if you look at the low density regime, which is the most relevant for quantum dot operation, uh, sorry, for quantum dot and, and the qubit operation in the single uh, hole regime, for example. Here you see, you still have a very high mobility, a high density around two or 300,000. Uh, but most importantly, you can achieve really, really low density, like 210 to the 10. And you're starting really to rival uh, three fives here, especially considering you have a full gate stack here. This is not modulation doping, which doesn't have any dielectric. So this is fully tunable. So actually this is really one of the lowest percolation density out there in, in, in group four. And also another thing that we highlight in this paper that I wanna bring your attention to is, if you start looking a bit beyond the simple qualitative metric of mobility, which captures only scattering that is relevant for transport, but you really look at quantum mobility, which is captures the really the lifetime, so the tau q, the single particle lifetime, 
this really takes into account all scattering events at all angles. This is probably a better metrics to qualify your material if you're thinking about uh, spin qubits because it captures every possible, uh, you know, uh, thing in the in the or or nasty thing in the in the in the crystal environment that could influence your 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 performance. Here we see that by burning the quantum well deeper, you see here really a boost in the two. Uh, quality indicators, which are, again, quantum mobility and percolation density. So this goes high and this goes low. So that's really nice. And we are now doing more studies on this platform and also on other platforms like election and silicon to really find a correlation in order to control disorder in these systems. But most importantly, uh, the experiments also in quantum dots show that here that, that there was a really nice improvement in, in the charge noise. Very low charge noise achieved uh, as average between many different devices that we measured. In some cases, here they, they were below uh, the, the, the detection limit of our instrument. So this was a clearly a big improvement. And again, so this the, the loop now closed because then this set of structure is our, let's say, a gold standard, which led to the four qubit experiment, which was published a few months ago in Nature, where really here we were able to put these qubits in a, in a two by two array, have really nice individual qubit uh, behavior. Here you see rabia, fast rabia oscillations, but most importantly, you can really control all the coupling turn on interaction one by one and really shuffle quantum information around. Here you can see by coupling qubits one to another progressively, you can split the resonance into the eight possible states of the other three qubits. And you can then put together these qubits and entangle them into a, a four qubit uh, state and then detangle them all in a coherent uh, manner. So this is to say that I believe really that this advance also really enabled the, in the materials have taken all the qubit experiment to, to the next level. Uh, with this, I wanna shift gears a little bit in the, in the remaining of the talk and uh, pick up on one of the qualities I mentioned uh, as a motivation, which is the fact that you can really contact uh, these, uh, this high quality whole gas, very low disorder whole gas with uh, a metal and uh, what about superconductors? Well, this opens the whole field of, of, of course, hybrid superconductor, semiconductor devices. Um, so, and the motivations, I mean, you can pick one, right? And there are many motivations to do experiments here. It can be either, you know, uh, spin qubit coupling, or it can be platforms for topological quantum computer. You can do gate mons. Or even you can just think of doing new ways of doing, uh, you know, just uh, Boolean logic at low temperature, which can be also useful as a uh, platform to actually have uh, low temperature, low power consumption electronics to control your qubits. So there are really a lot of applications. So we really started looking into this uh, with germanium and uh, the nice thing, uh, this uh, the, the progress hasn't been so far, at least up to now, that rapid compared to the silicon. Sorry, to the to the spin qubit work. I think mainly because we didn't put uh, too much effort in it. But now, as I will show you, there has been really some really exciting results from our group, which I want to share with you. So. Uh, to say it shortly, in the past uh, couple of years, in parallel, we have shown that. Here, if you use aluminum as a contact, you can really push uh, uh, Cooper pairs in this uh, very simple transistor structure. And remarkably, this, uh, this supercurrent was, you know, we could extend it for micron long uh, junctions. And this is really, really remarkable. It has to do with the, with the high quality and low disorder we have in the quantum well. Um, First experiments also done in, in our groups here in Delft and Menos, uh, and, and Menos group um, showed also that you can also have confined transfer in 1D. And then also other groups in Europe actually. So the group of uh, De Franceschi uh, showed uh, some other devices like a squid using our material from Delft. And also uh, the group of Katsaros in Vienna used our material to um, try a different kind of contacting where they etch the quantum well away and use like a, a, a sandwich of aluminum with niobium to increase the ICRN product, which was uh, actually poor in our first devices. And here it was enhanced. This is to say that really there's a lot happening in this area. But I guess the key question that the field is waiting an answer for is, can we really engineer a better superconducting contact, which is really transparent and it might have also a hard gap and large gap. So this is the question I think 
um, where the field is moving. And now I want to share recent work with you and uh, not only about this, but also other things that are in the pipeline in my group uh, uh, in regards to germanium. So take this as a bit of the preview of what's gonna happen. Um, so in terms of, um, of hybrid devices, Alberto has been working really hard to really develop a new way of contacting these quantum wells uh, using a technology, the one of silicide, which is again, mainstream in industry. And I, I think uh, really we had the, uh, we had, really good results recently. And uh, here you see an example of, of a device, an NS device where you can uh, measure spectroscopy. And uh, here you see a 2D plot um, where you can uh, tune, uh, uh, basically transferring this device from uh, in this NS device from really um, a closed spectroscopy regime to a really open regime. And in spectroscopy, we really see reduction of the ingots state and uh, at least two orders of magnitude, which in the literature, this is called, or at least uh, suggests a hard gap. And we also see enhancement of, of conductance in the, in the open regime. The nice thing is this is not a one-off. We measure many devices in millikelvin. This is also, I wanna give a lot of credit to, um, to the collaboration that we started with Bukan and Gene from, from QTEC for these uh, measurements of millikelvin. Really here, this is really reproducible and there are a lot of results coming and we're preparing a manuscript. Um, the other thing is that you can use the same technology to explore a completely different kind of uh, you know, uh, physics. For example, you can think of patterning superconductors here on large scale and, um, and then basically have a global top gate to tune uh, superconductivity on and off on a microscopic scale. And uh, these are again, uh, first results that we're writing up. Also in this case, we have a tunable gap here, tunable superconducting gap. And if you turn on the magnetic field, you see a typical frontal for pattern, but you also see some other features here that line up. And these are signature of commensurability due to the fact that you have many islands here. And the nice thing is that the, we see this um, um, transition and transfer where depending on gate and temperature, you can really go from a superconductor to an insulator via metallic state. And there's a lot of debate in the literature about this, uh, um, this, this uh, phenomena. So this is to say that this technology really is it's open for a lot of applications. Uh, the last few things I wanna say about germanium is that uh, this uh, might be the third, uh, let's say, iteration that we'll go through. So we haven't touched the strain so far, but uh, for devices. But again, at the material level, we really we we tend to advance faster, and then eventually this will go into, let's say, device. Uh, and here I want to show you a recent result uh, from uh, uh, Mario that we are we are writing up as well. Is that by tuning the strain, so doing a bit less strain structure we really have a super high quality uh, um, whole gas with reproducible, we achieve mobilities well in excess of a million and also uh, low percolation densities in this case. So in a way we kind of get both on the same wafer. So really big improvement. And here you see also quantum wall effect at low temperature. Really here you see that finally we get access to fractional quantum wall effect. Because we have low densities, we see all these fractions are relatively nice and uh, accessible magnetic fields. Again, here the question probably we will want to answer at some point is what is the optimal strain for spin qubits? And here you have a trade-off because these less strained have uh, structures have more spin orbit coupling in at least in 2D. So the question is, will, will this be good for qubits in the long run? And we hope to answer this question soon. But also, you know, there are other uh, prospects, for example, can we push superconductivity on this fractional quantum, quantum wall uh, edge states? And there are many proposals to use this for topological quantum information. So this is all to come in the future. And finally, uh, the last topic on where we're heading, which is uh, quite new, is the fact to not limit ourselves to only a single quantum well, but really to break into the third dimension and start talking about bilayers. So here you see a really beautiful uh, cross-section image of a double quantum well. Uh, in this case, it's still our first devices, so they're contacted uh, together. And uh, they are designed in such a way, so they are, you see, the bottom one is thicker and the top one is thin. 
so that by design with only one electrode, you can progressively um, basically populate the bottom quantum well and then the top quantum well. So this by design, and then we actually did the experiment and here I present this result really from Alberto and Beatrice, uh, um, who has been working hard on, on, on these measurements over the past, let's say three to four months. So let's look at these plots here. So you see as a function of gate, you see um, the whole density that you measure. So the density of the whole stack, the mobility, the fan diagram, and the Fourier transform of the same fan diagram. So what happens with gate is that you start having no density because these structures are undoped. As you tune up the gate, you start populating the bottom quantum well, but at some point the top quantum well starts populating. And this is clear. Here you get a saturation in density. Uh, and uh, here the fan diagram goes from a typical fan diagram of a single quantum well to a more complex pattern. And uh, beautifully here in Fourier transform, you see how that this is nothing more than the density that you get of the bands from Schubring of the us. Uh, this really nice linear increases due to the uh, bottom quantum well that is populating. Now, as you are increasing further, you're increasing the density of the top quantum well, keeping the other one constant in first approximation. So here you see all the signatures of this story. So the density from all effects starts to increase again. The mobility picks up again because now you have two channels of similar mobility. So also measuring them in parallel gives a, a reasonable mobility for the whole stack. In the fan diagram here, we reach this very important point where the two densities are actually equal and you get an anti-crossing at this resonance. And you see it beautifully in the Fourier transform here where you can appreciate the second quantum well being populated here. And if you we're also doing electrostatic modeling of the whole system and you really can reproduce these kind of curves. Also interesting here, you see an effect on the first quantum well with the density actually decreasing. And this is an effect due to a correlation between the two layers. It's a, a commensurability effect. So the question also is what will we do with these quantum wells? And uh, there are a lot of options we can think of actually moving into the third dimension for quantum circuits or even for hybrid devices. And um, if we're looking further down the track, the last uh, result really I want to put forward, it's more of a theoretical paper. It's actually my first <laughs> theoretical only paper I have co-authored. So I came up with this heterostructure where we try to combine electrons in silicon and holes in germanium. So let's say the best of the two platforms together. And why? Because we can really, have a very interesting band structure here because there is type two band alignment. This is very different from what you get with typical uh, gallium arsenide the three fives by layers. So you can really position these two quantum wells very close and contacting them independently because the let's say the implants that contact the electrons will not contact electrons here and vice versa. So it's really a nice system to play with. Because first of all, I think we are capable of making such structures. Here you see a first example where this dark line is a silicon, uh, very thin layer on top of a germanium quantum well in a silicon germanium uh, structure. So this is only growth. The neat thing is that we work with theorists and, uh, and they predict really for this system, uh, both ions and condensate at accessible temperature and densities. And so this really opens up a, a completely new field of physics that we would like to pursue. So this brings me to, to the end of, of, of this talk, but as, you, as you've seen, this is really not the end of, of, of our endeavor because we started with spin qubits. Uh, my talk ended up with uh, Bose exit on uh, condensate uh, with bilayer. So it's really about the road you are, you are following. And I think with, uh, hopefully I convince you that with at least germanium here, we are on a right road where we can really both advance uh, fundamental physics studies, but also really pave the way maybe to some practical quantum computing. But of course, this is just one road. There are many others. And I really, really encourage you to, to try to turn around the story as we tried with Holtz and Germanium, uh, turn around the story and challenge the status quo because we are really after those kind of unexpected advances that I think will really 
bring the field forward with uh, quantum computing. With this, I want to thank you for your attention. Yeah, let's give Joanna a big applause. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, great presentation. Absolutely uh, fantastic. Um, let's see, are there questions? Uh, if you have a question, please just unmute yourself and, and fire your question. Uh, hey, this is the brilliant presentation, thanks. Uh, I was wondering, so like the, the spin cubes that are being made, like because these are heavy holes, like I have vague memory from my masters of, uh, studies that they have a spin uh, three half. Right? Yeah, but and I, was, and I was wondering, it, does it have any any bearing like on how they? No, so uh, so actually, perform? it's a, it's basically a, well, we can talk about semantics and so forth, so on and so yeah. forth. But it's basically a two level quantum system because it's a projection because of the confinements. So the J the J Z. Uh, is uh, basically plus three half or minus three half, so it's effectively yeah. a, um, a two. Yeah, level. but anyway, I, I definitely it can have effect when you do like the excitons, right? Because they can start recombining ah. anything. Oh, okay, but okay. I, I wonder whether, except or that, whether there is anything just on the spin qubit level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you say there there isn't really anything particular. Uh, okay. I mean, uh, to first order, then uh, there might be some intricacies uh, for uh, qubit control and operation, which I might not be aware. Uh, but yeah, for this mm -hmm. question, probably I, I'm not the one uh, in a position to answer. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, great question. We should also bear in mind that, that these are typically not pure heavy holes, and there's still some light hole mixture into this, and, and uh, it's very relevant in this discussion. Yeah, and that happens once you start confining them into nanostructures, of course. Yeah. Exactly. Um, are there more questions? Can I ask about this uh, sort of Outlook platform that you showed a bit at the end with this sort of 3D uh, uh, type, or I don't, yeah, for example, here, yeah, where you have, let's say, where you could think now you can have, let's say, a dot in silicon and then a hole in germanium, and I guess they couple. Uh, do you think this could be sort of interesting to, let's say, uh, challenge the, uh, let's say, uh, connectivity issue that you would have in like large arrays, such that you could have like one of the dots essentially being a charge sensor for the actual quantum computing dot that sits then in the other platform. Absolutely. So the idea here is that here I drew a structure where there is no barrier in between, but actually this is the most complex structure you can think of. The easiest is just to have layers further away. And in that structure, it makes a lot of sense to envision architectures and again, uh, uh, where, you know, the, the, the beauty of this idea is that you can contact them selectively. So when you contact silicon, you don't contact germanium because if you had two layers of germanium, it would be more challenging to, you know, contact layers independently. But from an architecture point of view, yes, absolutely. There are, this opens up a new path for more complex uh, circuits not only for spin qubits, but for quantum simulation as well, I would say. And uh, where you have an added dimension, which, which might be necessary for certain applications, definitely. Thanks. Great, other questions? Maybe I can ask uh, something, Jordana. Yeah. So I, I, I hadn't appreciated this until recently, but because of the uh, effective mass and other uh, properties, the germanium wave function as compared to silicon is not only larger in the in-plane direction, but also in the out-of-plane direction. In the Z direction. Exactly. And so in silicon, there's often um, uh, challenges due to, for example, sensitivity to the interface, in particular valley physics and all of that. Now, if the germanium is also larger in the Z direction, would you also expect that there's some intrinsic uh, advantage um, when it comes to sensitivity to interfaces, for example. This is a, this is a good question. I think it again boil, boils down, yes, to the effective mass, 
but not only the fact that you know it's it's yeah it's thicker the wave function but the quantum well can be thicker so you can grow a, a thicker quantum well and so you can spread the wave function more in there so in a way you could be less sensitive to interfaces the other aspect is that the electric constant that is much larger than in silicon um so that can be a plus at the same time yeah i think it's also good to to talk about maybe uh you know yeah i mean the, the fact uh, i mean here we are not really interested in valleys but about g factors i think that that's the variability we we care most i guess for these structures but as your results have shown you can also tune those so uh, you know yeah maybe there is an advantage uh, yeah, it would be nice to, to to actually design an experiment to prove this. Yep, I agree. Are there more questions? If not, then let's thank Giordano once more with a big applause. Mute yourself. And, thank you uh, very much. Thank you. And thank you all for attending QTech 360. And see you until next time.